Blog Talk Radio. To introduce you. Okay. Well, Taz, our guest, our second guest, Tom Kenyon, journeys throughout the world opening the fields of his personal knowledge from the scientists, sciences to spirituality. A teacher, a scientist, sound healer, psychotherapist, musician, songwriter, singer, shaman, and author. Yes, our guest wears all those hats. And the Hathors are our guests as well. Can't wait. They come along with Tom, as they are interdimensional beings who work through Tom Kenyon's amazing, almost four-octave voice. You are now listening to the International Taz and Paula Show, and I'm Paula. And I'm Taz. Paula, my heart is just jumping right now. How fortunate can we be to capture a snip of the heavens with the sounds that emanate from the halls of Tom Kenyon's vocals? His teachings actually mesmerize one. It's it's like a time lapse. It's like a photographic time lapse, um, allowing for a time of introspection within that nourishes us with sounds that heal, sounds that bring back essences of ourselves we may have forgotten about. And now in Tom's latest newsletter, um, he just said he talks about the spheres of all possibilities. In this new message he shares with us all, a method for manifesting outcomes in our 3D reality as well as in other dimensions of our being. And hopefully today he'll share one of the simplest and ironically most effective ways to manifest. Well, we all need that. Uh, well, today we have Tom in our little studio hall for an hour, and so if you have any questions, you can call the following number. It's 347-633-9155. And Tom, you are heaven sent. You've been with us before, <laughs> and we're so excited to have you with us again. Thank you nice for taking the time to be with us. You're welcome. Nice to be here. Um, for the people well, uh, who are newbies, let's say, uh, can you kind of explain how you and the Hawthors, um came connected? Um, they were uninvited guests, you might say. <laughs> um, I was a practicing psychotherapist for many years. I was involved in brain research for 10 years. And um, this alternate reality that the Hathors are about was... Um, very alien to me. Uh, I, I just considered it kind of like creative fantasy. And I was doing a um, medita- personal meditation retreat. I guess this was like 17, 20 years ago. And um, it's totally unrelated to anything remotely connected to the Hathors. And after I had finished uh, one of the meditations, I experienced two of them in the room psychically. I could see them psychically. Not, I never see them physically. And they started giving me information about the brain and geometry and consciousness that I had to recognize was very powerful because I'd been working in this area for a while, but I couldn't accept who they said they were or where they came from. So it was a a long period of many years of stretching my, I I guess you might call it my blinders of perception. And um, I could accept that what they were giving was valid and important information but i really had i wrestled with the nature of their reality and so over the years it's been almost 20 years i have come to understand this their view of reality is very different than mine and um most people's because we're we are localized in time and space we experience our life along a line a straight line we're born we have experiences we die they experience reality from a different geometry. It's much more expanded. And so their views are different. And so I I find that their views, I look at their views as creative catalysts, evolutionary catalysts. And every time I engage what they offer, um, it creates novel, interesting, and sometimes very profound results. And others have have discovered the same thing for themselves. Now, from the beginning of the time that you started working with them till now, um, have you seen a difference in your audience? Um, has the audience come up a different dimension or level since you've been 
beginning to work with people? Uh, could you rephrase that? Well, you're, with the people that you're working with through the, you know, with the Hathors, mm-hmm. have you seen a difference in the 20 years of the people that are coming to you and listening to your workshops? And I mean, are they also on a higher level as we go up the, you know, the we're not three dimensional anymore. So, are you seeing groups of people growing as well? Oh yeah, definitely. And more people are. Um, being drawn to this that are having a paradigm shift in their own life, and so they enter this work at a, at a juncture in their views about their life and their potential, and it's really fascinating to watch that. And it doesn't just happen with the Hathors. I know it happens with other um, bodies of information that are evolutionarily advanced, whether they are a system developed by a, you know, humans, quote-unquote, <laughs> or coming from another dimension of consciousness. So I know many, this is happening all over the world. Judy and I have been around the world six times now. We just completed a world teaching tour, and it's happening all over the world. There's a a growing wave of people recognizing that they can't live their life the way they used to, that it's not working, and they're searching for ways to bring a different way of living forward. And and it's very exciting, that, that aspect of it. Well, I know personally, if I look back in my life in the last 20 years, um, I'm accepting so much more now than I did 20 years ago. I mean, if if you presented something to me 20 years ago, I, I would think, oh, well, I don't know about that. Compared yep. to now, I'm completely <laughs> open. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. So I'm guessing that other people are the same. Yeah, you know, I think that part of that is our, where our civilization is at the moment, the, the Western civilization and the world culture. The, the things are changing so rapidly, and people are recognizing that um, they can't live the way they've been living. That something's wrong with our culture. Our, our civilization is a signature of failure, and we are how we're interacting with the world and other life forms on the on the planet itself and the ecosystems are just devastating, and so we have to change how we are living. And people are are searching for what is the pathway they will take to live differently, both for themselves, for their, you know, and future generations, and for the planet. Well, you know, Tom, um, I don't know, about 1996, I had my own personal encounter with a Hathor happening one morning in, in in the warm sun on the edge of my bed while meditating. And I think when I experienced seeing the Hathor, and by the way, I had the only reason I knew it was a Hathor, I could see it in my mind's eye, my third eye, and I had seen your book. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Otherwise, I wouldn't have known it would came out of the clear blue sky. And um, And what I remember the most, during that experience, it was that I felt as I was encompassed with this love that just embraced me so fully right. that, uh, you know, I, and it, it just stops you dead in your tracks. I mean, it's like going, wow, let me just experience this. And, and ever since, I mean, to know that your music and your sound and, and whatever they give you at this point, just, wow, oh, it's immense. And, for you to carry this and bring forth what they're sharing with you to make an alteration and supporting humanity in its new in its new life form of, that's been transversing since the very beginning here since you began i it's really pretty awesome it just makes me so excited <laughs> and, well, that, sense of love, that sense of love is the char- the main characteristic of the Hathors. They are. Um, yeah. They have a, a. They live in a vibratory state of love that is um, quite striking when one encounters them. Yeah. Oh wow. So, your your. Go ahead, Paula. I hear your. <laughs> <laughs> well, go ahead, because I think I can jump in after what you're going to say. Okay. Well, and now, you know, we just got this new newsletter and um and you're you're talking about 
the sphere of all possibilities and how and how uh, supporting people looking and being connected with their their soul essence every step of the way and it's really exciting and uh in in this newsletter you actually shared how to how to simply look at how to do this and today somewhere in the show it'd be really fun if you would share part of this with us well sure I can uh you know part of the the idea of what they're bringing forward is that how we they look at term things in terms of um vibratory levels and geometric configurations and perceptual um openings you might say so those are their many of the paths they use and so they say that we live in a um confining sense of time you know we as i said earlier we many of us live uh, with the sense that we live on a line a 3d timeline we are born we do things in our life we try to make things happen there are failures there are successes along the way and then poof we're gone and that's our life and they have to say well that's a very restrictive way of looking at it that there are other geometries give uh, different ways of entering into potential and this is actually not an idea unique to them this is shared by many indigenous cultures that they look at time as, as spirals or different configurations and so there are potentials like the indigenous peoples um the aborigines and um some of the uh, native traditions because they look at life as a spiral or another configuration than a line they really can communicate with their ancestors that's a vivid real experience for them it's not fantasy it's just because the ancestors are right there because they live in a conception of time that's different than most of us so they have potentials that others don't so they can literally talk to their ancestors and i had an experience many many years ago i was in anchorage alaska teaching a hathor workshop and all of a sudden the door opened and i felt a presence an immense presence come into the room um before she entered and she entered with um one of my organizers for the event and she was a very small woman and it was striking I almost stopped in my tracks because the energy of this person was huge M- like there you know massive and there was a woman who was barely over 4 feet tall she went to the back of the room and sat down on the floor and she was a yupik a yupik shaman healer and i did my thing and after it was over um she came up to speak with me and i'd never had an encounter with a yupik before um and it was interesting because she was looking down as we would speak and our eyes rarely met and when they would meet there was just for a moment and then we were both looking down at the ground as we were talking to each other and the organizer later said to me without well, that i was watching the conversation i don't know what you were talking about but i thought it was interesting that you were being culturally appropriate because that's how these conversations take place is that people look down to the ground and glance at each other's eyes just briefly but what she said to me was just floored me in the moment and it speaks to what the hathers are talking about uh she said that when she was a child she was uh raised by missionaries catholic missionaries and they would beat them the native children when they spoke their language and because it was part of the conditioning to get them out of their culture into the white culture and so she was beaten a lot and all the other children were beaten and her her grandmother happened to be a yupik healer who worked with herbs and so one day she was collecting herbs and the nuns found her doing this and it was forbidden to do anything of this nature and they beat her and she said they beat her so hard that she almost died and she was um in the hospital of the of the health center in her bed and um going into the death rounds and she realized she was dying and she heard this voice singing and the, she she followed to the voice in the darkness and was she said the voice healed her and brought her back and then so she's looking at the ground the whole time we we're talking and then she looks up and looks straight in and on the, first of all this woman was probably 20 years older than me okay so she came into this experience 3D life 20 years before me and so she looks up from the ground straight in my eyes and says and that voice i heard was you you were the one who sang to me and brought me back to life and i came to thank you well, i just about fell down ah. on the floor 
because it was at that point a violation of my understanding of <laughs> how things work. This was, you know, close to 20 years ago. And um but that was again, she was coming from a different experience of time and therefore that opened potentials to her that were not available. She could talk to her ancestors. She had that experience where out of time sequence and that was a vivid reality. So the Hathers, in their message, there are, there are many geometries that can open potentiality, and they talk about one, which is they call the sphere of all possibilities. And essentially what they're saying is that we are have been hypnotized by our culture to believe that we are confined in our potential and in uh, how we live our life and the line that we live. And the Hathers would say, open that up and experiment with the, with the possibility and one of these possibilities is a sphere, and the sphere encompasses the entire universe. And you can draw potentials and energies from anywhere in the cosmos to assist you in what you are choosing to do in your life. And it's a very exciting concept for me, and I've been working with it, and it does create some very strong, uh, palpable results. But as I said, the Hathor, this this idea of a different way of looking at life instead of a line is not exclusive to the Hathors. The indigenous peoples, um, many of them have this understanding. What they're bringing forward is a, a sphere that encompasses the entire universe and that you can draw from this sphere to yourself. And so I always, when I work with people, I always say, look at it as an experiment in consciousness. I never would presume to say this is how anything is. In fact, the Hathors never say this is how it is. They're not dogmatic. They say, this is what we have found helpful. Give it a try. Well, I know I've, I've played sometimes when I need some answers and I might connect with a doctor or an artist. So that is similar to what you're saying? Or mm-hmm. it's, it's more of a universal mind that you're talking about? Well, the mind, the universal mind, is so, it's so many... People have different concepts of what that is, but um, I would, from my understanding, the universe, the cosmos, is alive with consciousness, and you can draw from other dimensions of consciousness other than your own in order to assist you in what you have chosen to do in your life or in a given moment. Can you give us? Uh, an example on how you would do this? How you would draw to you? Mm -hmm. I mean, would you meditate? Would you sit and meditate? Or Well, you know, you can um, sit and meditate. And essentially, I think what has to happen is that we have to shift our brain state so that we become in a receptive state of mind and body so that we can be sensitive to and aware of other information outside of the normal range that we are used to. So what I have found actually is that you don't have to sit down and meditate. You have to shift your brain state and to the receptivity and the expectation that something will come to assist you. And what it what I've actually come down to the understanding is that it doesn't require any time at all. It can be instantaneous. It's really a matter of what your beliefs are and your expectations and how open you are to, to receiving assistance. So the the Hathers always are they are very they have a a intrinsic sense of amusement at existence. And I think that's because they're outside of the gravity well. Outside of 3D life, they look at our, they look at the three dimensions from outside of it, so they can be amused. But when you're living inside of it, like we are, you, and all of us listening to this show right now, we are living a life in three dimensions and affected by gravity. So sometimes it's not so amusing. <laughs> but but the, <laughs> but if, what the irony is, I found that when I can, even when things are very difficult and intense, if I can shift my brain state and enter into a more a more fluidity, greater fluidity, uh, I can suddenly experience that intensity in a very different way, and I'm not locked in. And I think that's really, I think, if there was one thing that I would 
one word I would say. It's, it's the potential to live life locked in to what we have been given, what we were taught, or to open up to new possibilities. And it's a choice point for everyone. And some people just would rather stay locked in and blame and other people, other cultures, whatever the problems are, there's always a scapegoat. And so a person can be locked in or they can free themselves to new possibilities. And so for me, back to you, I'm rambling because it's such a complex question you're asking. Yes, meditation is a means to shift brain state and then become open to these new possibilities. But it doesn't require, in my experience now after doing this for, I've been doing this work for, God, three decades. You know, I was doing this ten years before I met the Hathors, this type of work. And I used to think I would have to, okay, I'm, I need to go in and meditate and spend 30 minutes to an hour centering and doing mantras and get to a place where I can open to a possibility. Because time is speeding up, there's often not time to do that. And what I've actually discovered is it doesn't take any time. I can shift Ooh. my state in a moment. It's an act of personal will. Once you're familiar with how it feels in those meditative states, you can just say, okay, I'm there now. And your brain will immediately shift. And so in the moment, it's possible to shift into a greater fluidity and greater potential. It doesn't take time. I used to think that it would take time to get into these these states of consciousness. Now I realize it does not take time. It's a belief that it takes time. It's actually one of our potentials to to move into the state of high fluidity and receptivity um, quickly. It's just a matter of learning, training the brain how to do that. So like learning how to ride a bicycle or type. You can do it this under any circumstance. Um, And I would qualify under any circumstances subject to how intense I experience the moment. Like when something is very intense emotionally, I sometimes forget (laughs) that I can do this. But if I remember and I make the, the shift in that moment, then suddenly the intensity is not experienced the same way it was before, and I see new possibilities that I didn't see previously. Oh, I like that. You know, that's pretty interesting. That's like stepping outside of yourself and looking inward to, mm-hmm. and through the drama. Yes, right. I like that. I like that. Now, in the newsletter, you kind of shared, like, there's several chakras um, or, or that you can attach this sphere to, but mm-hmm. you talk about going into a meditation and uh, allowing this sphere, or excuse me, your solar plexus, which is kind of like uh, the top of your stomach <laughs> area, um, right. to... Um, letting it be the middle of this sphere. And this sphere that you produce, I I think of it as being a light, a light ball that you said you need to have it as large as your body. You have as large as the universe or as small as Oh, okay. (laughs) Oh, good. All right. And then you spoke about, which just really excites me, to think that you take another, maybe a duality of yourself and, like, where you want to go and you place mm-hmm. this, your body in another duality where you'd like to manifest something. And you can already picture in the second sphere and yourself uh, doing the um, the steps where you would like to produce what you want to produce in this different aspect. And you already, pro- you can see yourself producing it and you do the steps that you need to do. Then you can come back to yourself where you are now, I'll say in three dimension. <laughs> okay. Come back to yourself in three dimension. And then you can, uh, I, I'm lost here. I forget what you said. You actually said that you can bring this other manifest itself outside of yourself back to where you operate out of Mm -hmm. and create what you want. Did I see that right, Tom? Yeah, pretty much. Um, Okay, tell me. 
the technique is simple, but it's, there's so many elements. I would suggest that people go to the website and read, you know, the, the actual steps involved. But the the essence of this is that the the sphere of all possibilities is in the Hath- in Hathor's way of viewing it, it's the entire cosmos. So that's a very huge space. We're talking about um, the known observable universe. Uh, astrophysicists estimate that it is something like 456 billion light years, the radius, just the radius. So that's huge, a huge space. And some physicists say the universe may actually be infinite, but the known observable universe is very huge. And what the Hathers are saying is this is a mental thing to put your awareness in the solar plexus or the heart or the higher chakras. They say that most people it will work more easily with the solar plexus. And what you're doing is creating a future self that you imagine what you will be like, what you will feel like when you have the experience of what you're wanting to manifest. Whatever, let's say um, you're wanting health um, or you're wanting uh, a something that will enrich you creatively. And so you imagine yourself in the future having this. And the as soon as you do this, the energy from the sphere of all possibilities brings in these multidimensional energies into your solar plexus and it projects into your future self. And the future self becomes stronger, more vital in your imagination. And then it starts to affect you in your how you respond to 3D life. So this is abstract. Let me ground it in some research that was done in sports psychology. So all of this, this is, sounds like way, way out there, and it is, but it is actually based, uh, you know, it can be explained in terms of neurophysiology and what, what our potentials are as people. And it was found in, in sports research that you can take an athlete, and one of the studies was with basketball, and they had um, a group that, that would just shoot hoops, okay, like normal. You would practice, and the better you, the more you do it, the better you get. That's the basic strategy of how the brain works. The brain learns a new pattern. Then it learns that when you miss the hoop, the brain eventually realizes what it was doing wrong with eye-hand coordination, and it learns, and then you start shooting better. Okay, so that was one group, traditional way of learning how to do. Then they took another group that only imagined it, They actually never did anything. They just imagined it. And then they had a third group that did the the actual exercises, you know, the hoop shooting over and over again, just like the first group. But in addition, they took time to go into a receptive state. They didn't call it meditation. They called it um, creative imagination. And they imagined every detail of shooting a correct hoop. So these have, in other words, they're doing the outer reality, 3D, and they're doing the inner reality of imagining in detail what it is that they needed to do in order to hit the hoop. And this went on for several weeks, and then they compared. Everybody shot hoops. And the fascinating thing was was that, of course, the first group improved. That's to be expected. The second group that only imagined it did do better than a group that might not have ever shot a hoop at all. But the third group, the group that actually did the physical outer reality work and the inner reality work, shot more hoops than the control group that only did it physically. So in other words, from the standpoint of psychology, when a person uses their, engages their imagination strong enough and in detail enough, they will actually improve their function their performance, whether it's sports or pretty much um, any area of human behavior. So that's grounded in how our psychology works. What the Hathers are, but the Hathers, of course, take it to another level because they are outside of, (laughs) they think things so differently than we do. And they have told me, yes, Tom, that is true, that when you do this in your imagination, you are actually increasing the probability that you will be having, you will get what you are asking for in terms of changes that you're pursuing in your life. But they say, we don't look at it just that way. We think that actually is occurring, is that you are creating another reality. And that reality, they call it the magnetic attractor. And the magnetic attractor starts to draw to it serendipity. Situations, people that bring 
the possibility of what you're asking for into probability instead of possibility. And so from their standpoint, we as creator beings, we when we do this sphere of all possibilities, we are creating an alternate reality, and it's being magnetized. It becomes a magnetic attractor and then pulls us in from our current experience into that future experience. And it can happen rather quickly. And how long it takes is a, is a function of um, how radical a change it is you're wanting to create and your beliefs about how long it takes to unfold something in your life. But the whole thing is grounded in my... When they gave me the technique, I remembered these studies in sports psychology. say, ah, yes, this makes sense to me. Remember uh, years ago they had psychocybernetics? Mm-hmm. I don't know if you ever ran across that. Mm-hmm. But that's what they, they were teaching. Your example with the basketball players. Right. Mm-hmm. So the Hawthors is just taking it one step further. Yeah, the Hawthors say that it's not just imagination, that when you do it s- strongly enough, you're literally creating an alternate reality, an alternate timeline, in which you are experiencing what you wish to experience. And then that begins to unfold because the magnetic attractor, the more you, as you energize it with the sphere of all possibilities, so that you, it's not just imagination. It's something having to do with the nature of created reality itself. So, as you say, uh, we are in a sphere of all possibilities. Yeah, we all, all just... are all in the sphere of all possibilities, you know, and if you look at a young child before they're conditioned, they are the brain of a child is like a superconductive computer. They are incorporating so many levels of information, and they learn things very, very quickly. And um, I, we see this all over the world when we travel, and children will learn how to speak English in a foreign country before the parents do. And so oftentimes we we're talking to the parent, but the child is the translator. We're speaking I to them English because we don't, know, we don't know Chinese or whatever it is, but the child, the young child is, saying, is, is, tra- is being the translator because their brains are able to learn this information um, much quicker than their parents because it's the nat- they, a child is living in the sphere of all possibilities. And it's only as their peers and their teachers and society says, well, no, you can't do that. The question you can't really doesn't um, occur to a child until they're taught or, you know, a feedback mechanism where they realize whether they can't jump off the roof of the garage (laughs) without hitting the ground despite having watched Superman. Tom, I just had a phone call. In the phone call, there was a gentleman that said, um, I think he, he was asking, uh, do, you, is, do you have to practice this or do you have to do something in advance to be able to, to do this um, capability? And um, when I was reading through your newsletter, I got the feeling that if people just sat for a little bit that they would be able to begin practice with this with some ease. Am I wrong? No, it's very simple. And a person, yeah. and anyone could do this that is, um, you know, can follow the show here. <laughs> They've got what it is required in order to do, use this technique. And the more you use it, the more effective you become and the more you understand how this works. And so anybody can do this pretty much. What I would suggest to the people that are listening to the show is that they go to the website and go to the Hathor section and go to the message that says the sphere of all possibilities, and then there's the steps. Steps are laid out very clearly, and that's all free information. Oh, good. Okay. Um, Well, this, you you know, again. You want to give out the website? Yeah. Uh, Sure, it's www.tomkenyon.com. Very simple. And they would go to the Hathor, when they go to the homepage, there's the tabs, and one says Hathors. And they just go, click on that, and they'll go, there's all the past messages they've given, and the latest one is the sphere of all possibilities. And it's their message, and then I explain my perspective and give the steps involved. So everything is right there. 
and you can take the ball and run with it. So do you suggest to start out with something simple? I mean, not oh, God, too yes. complicated. Absolutely. Yeah. Simplicity is like learning a new skill of anything. You, the simpler, the better. But take something. They, they're the reason they're giving this is because they on in November fifth they're going to be doing a world hatha meditation, which is to see new realities of a more benevolent future for humanity. That's why they are giving this technique. And it just so happens that the technique can be used for personal uh, reasons and. But their reason for introducing this is because they want people to work with it who choose to um, join the meditate the world meditation. So that's why it's coming forward at this time. So the world and actually meditation. on your website you you have that meditation, yes. excuse me, that date and everything, which is November 4th. Um, yes, I think. And everyone from all over the world can do it. And you get that information on your website. Um, right. And not only that, but you're going to be in Seattle, Washington, um, uh, and there is a workshop on November 2nd to the 4th, The Art of Seeding New Realities. Right. So this meditation comes at the end of all of this, right? Yes, yeah, the last hour of this event. And the event, yeah. we the Hathor energies come in and work with everyone, and we go over how to refine the technique, and then we... Um, on the last hour of that, the, the Sunday, it's um, we do the world meditation, and we're joined by tens of thousands of people all over the world. And so, Tom, and, and your Tom last night, I experienced something really incredible, and I and I need to go back and um, pull a few CDs and um, and bring them home. But on your website, people are actually able to listen to a partial CD and get the um, the wonderful uh, tones of healing into the body through just some of these yeah, aspects. Yeah, right. The, so the, they they the website, that tab is called Listen. There's a tab oh. called Listen, and all, there's all these audio files that a person can listen to that deal with all types yeah. of different things, and all that information is free. And for those of you who are uh, our listeners who are scientifically oriented, I would suggest they click on a button called Acoustic Brain Research, and that will go into the science and research studies uh, behind the effects of sound on consciousness. Good. And I just want to let people know also, you're going to be in Seattle, Washington, September the 1st to the 5th, and there's a sound healing training at that time. And, you know, if you can all go, I, I, I'm telling you, it is really something to be within a session. I just got done telling Paula, Paula, we need to travel <laughs> and be and spend some time with Tom. It's like, you know what, you are totally transformed. It is so incredible to be with you. And uh, and then you have another retreat on Orcas Island in Washington, October 7th through the 9th. And that's a Buddhist tantric meditation retreat. Right. And um, uh, let's see. Um, and then again, I guess you have. Uh, looks like the the one for November 11th through the 13th is closed. But um, you know. No, there's still some space. There's still some space in that one. Is there? We okay. have a very large venue, a very large ballroom uh, for that event. Okay, and I'm telling you, you're you're. Your whole, um, your wonderful events fill fast, so you need to really step on it if you want to be included in this. It's and again, his website is TomKenyon.com, and that's T-O-M like Tom, and then Kenyon is K-E-N-Y-O-N.com. So, now, Tom, I have um, a question. You have yes. a beautiful, beautiful voice, and. Um, did you sing or do any of this type of work before you started working with the half Forest? Yeah, I was actually a musician uh, before, uh, way before the Hathors ever came along, and I pl- played in bars and lounges. I was a lounge <laughs> singer. That's how I put myself through college. <laughs> that and cook, being a restaurant cook, quick order cook. <clears throat> so I was... Um, Early on, I discovered that music could make change people's mood. I could change the mood of a bar by the types of music I played. But I didn't understand how that happened 
what what the mechanisms were until many years later when I got into acoustic brain research. But I was singing early on, and my mother was a singer. She used to sing with the big bands. She was actually the circus woman, the elephant girl. Back in those days, the 30s and 40s, uh, circuses would come into town and there would be a parade, and she was the woman on top of the elephant. And she uh, also sang with the big band on the big top. So I got my voice from my mother. But what I found interesting was with the Hathors, um, I would say that musically speaking, I my vocal range was probably around three octaves. And as the Hathors started working with me, they stretched everything, my mind, <laughs> my heart, uh, and my vocal range in order to accommodate the vibratory energies they were trying to bring through. So my vocal range expanded almost an octave from what it was naturally in the course of working with this energy for like 20 years. So that's peculiar and interesting to me. Well, well I, I, I even, liked what I you... <laughs> no, I was going to say, I've even, I've even played uh, your CDs uh, in my garden. Ah. And watch, uh, yes, and, and watch the nature spirits come alive. So I, I can believe that. <laughs> I had my, one of my favorite stories about my music is that um, there was a woman in Africa in a um, refuge for animals that were um, harmed, and they were, you know, treating them and healing them before they could release them back to the wild. And she lived in a her the room that she was in the hut or whatever didn't have any windows that could be closed, and she would play um, I think it was soma, but she would play one of my CDs at night to just relax it before she went to sleep. And she said all the animals that could walk came to the window. So she had a giraffe sticking its head in and water buffalo and all types of animals would just come literally to her place to listen to the music. <laughs> and I love that. I, that I can just picture that. that. <laughs> How wonderful. And then the other thing I that I read and I thought, boy, how true that is. Um, you know, your 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 science, you work with your personal knowledge, personal knowledge from the sciences to spirituality, and and each intensive that you work with people um, in groups um, is. You know, it's cast in knowledge relative to the subject, and it's overlaid with sounds and everything that you that you speak. And it says in one section, in other words, if you don't fully get the transmission from the words, you can you can't escape the truth of it when the sounds are projected from his voice toward you. And I thought, wow, that isn't the truth. Um, I don't know what happens to the body, but you definitely. Again, it's the vibration or whatever it is. The truth just comes into your body, and you automatically know, even if your brain doesn't know consciously. <laughs> it's it's pretty incredible. And listening to your MP3s last night that I went through with some again, and I went, oh my gosh, talk about transporting oneself um, and, and uh, into your own soul in a, in a different way. It just really is profound. I can't imagine living without those sounds that you produce. <laughs> it really is. And I can just imagine it going all throughout the universe, and just like your previous story with um, the lady that came into the room, you know. it's Boy, it must be really out there, Tom. I don't know what you did in a prior lifetime, but... Um, uh, we're all living all these lives together. If we look at the timeline, we're, we're living more than one life at a time. Is that true? Um, I never say that anything is true, but I, oh. I can say that's my experience, yes. Okay. <laughs> <You know? laughs> that's my belief, subject to reality. <laughs> but I do experience multiple living multiple timelines simultaneously a lot of the time. <laughs> Yeah. Are you familiar with Bruce Lipton's work? Oh, yeah, he's, he's brilliant. I love Bruce Lipton's work. I've been following it for years. Yeah. He's a major contributor to the interface between science and spirituality. And I, I think it's important 
to bring those two together because there is a tendency when people get involved in spirituality to um, swallow dogma and beliefs about things just taking everything in as truth. And I think and I, I tell people to always have an imaginary box by your side and whatever anyone says, especially when we get into spiritual things, don't accept it as true just because somebody says it is. Test it in your life. And so there is this um, kind of anathema and this um, discord between those who are logically based uh, and scientifically based and those who are intuitive and, and move into spiritual matters. And what I find is that when the two are brought together, even though they're strange bedfellows, they're, science is a very different way of approaching the perception of reality, but it's very precise. And spirituality is another way. And when you bring those two together, the territory where they meet is really significant and fascinating. And Bruce Lipton is one of the four figures in this, and um, I think his work is brilliant. Um, can anyone bring in the Hathors? I mean, are they available for anyone to ask for help from them or ask for suggestions from them? Oh, you yes, that's a very complex question. <laughs> Looks simple on the on the um, surface of things. Um, the answer is yes and no. <laughs> so the yes is that um, they live in a vibratory level that anybody can access. But you have to access that level of vibration in order to have a conversation with them or to interact with them. Sometimes they will show up spontaneously in a person's life. This have other people have other beings do the same thing, other dimensional intelligences. So a person may have something in their their nature or something in their life that's getting ready to unfold. That's you know a, a turning point. And I, I've noticed, you know, I've been doing transpersonal psychology for 30 years. And when these turning points in a life occurs, like when often, unfortunately, it presents itself as a crisis, but it doesn't have to. But when life is about to turn and major changes are afoot, this is an, a crack in the cosmic egg, so to speak. And uh, dimensional inter interdimensional energies can find a way in. Normally, they might not be able to. And so a person is a little more permeable when suddenly we're not quite sure what's happening <laughs> in our life and we become more permeable and sometimes and these beings can come through and communicate. So if a person had a previous um, alignment or interaction with these beings at this moment in their life, uh, the Hathors or another being might come through, but a person has to be in a certain vibratory level for that to occur. And sometimes these things happen, as I said, spontaneously. My favorite story about this was... Um, a woman who lived in Wyoming, and I was teaching a Hathor workshop, and she was attending, and um, she said, um, I, I started describing my experience of how they look and how they interact, and she had this look of, like, utter, um, I mean, she was starting to cry, and um, I said, what happened? She said, well, many years ago, this was like 20 years earlier, she had divorced her husband. She was in a major life transition, moved out on the desert, and lived in her trailer. And it was the middle of the night, um, early morning, and um, all of a sudden she felt this huge presence in the trailer, and it was a 14-foot tall Hathor, but she didn't know it was a Hathor at that point. She never experienced them. And he said to her, I have come to instruct you. And she said... There's no way. I am a single divorced woman living out in the middle of the desert, living in a trailer, and you're a 14-foot man standing with your head through the roof of my trailer. Get out of here. <laughs> and so he immediately disappeared. And so, of course, her vision was psychic vision. She was seeing him because physically the Hathors are He was not physically present. He was psychically present in the trailer. But she had the impression of his head going through the roof. And so she said, I think that might have been a Hathor. So she, the workshop was three days long, so the next, that night she went home and she um, sent out a, an intention, you might call it, or a prayer. I think those are the same thing. Prayer and intention are the same thing. But she sent out word, if you or a Hathor, please, I'm, I'm open to you coming back. And so she said she thought, really, that was ridiculous, a silly thing for her to do. So she was washing the dishes, 
And so she felt this presence behind her. She turned around. It was the same Hathor that had approached her 20 years ago. And he said, I'm still available to instruct you. She said, I would love it. And so she started her relationship with a Hathor mentor. So, um, And I love that story for several reasons. One is the humor of it. But another is that it points to the fact that the Hathors never imposed their will. He did not try to convince her or do anything. Her her will, they, they consider our will to be sovereign. And so that was her will, and he said, okay, bye. Twenty years passed, and he came back when she asked, as if no time had passed. For her, it had been 20 years. But to him, living outside the constraints of time and space, it was a blink of an eye. It was no big deal. So the answer like to your question is yes. I didn't hear what you said. I said it's almost like we're in a sandbox. Oh, God, that- yes. <laughs> <laughs> I was having a conversation with a physicist in Zurich many years ago. We ha- had lunch, and he said, there's no such thing as the laws of the universe. I said, what do you mean? He said, we are perceiving things and come up with descriptions of what we're observing and call them laws. He said, but really what's happening is it's like we are children watching our parents play bridge and we think we understand the game, and then all of a sudden they change their mind and start playing canasta. And the rules have changed. And he said there are no laws of the universe. I thought that was a very interesting comment from a physicist who works with the laws of the universe. Yes. Well, you, you know, what, the doors. What, I, what I picture when you say the crack of the egg, that when somebody's in chaos is mm-hmm. when new things can come in. And our world is in chaos, so as a group, mm-hmm. our egg is cracked. I mean, this is how I'm picturing it. Uh-huh. So do you think that this is the timing right now for our cracked egg to allow some new things to come in and help us? Yeah, I think that uh, our egg is definitely cracked. <laughs> it's a cracked <laughs> <laughs> Collectively, yes. <laughs> um, and there, you know, it's a weird thing that uh, this is just my experience in in the moment of cultural opening. Um, you know, the same thing happened when Rome fell, and there was chaos, and this, similar things happened when you look historically, when there were different turning points in civilization, and and so good things come in, and some not so good things come in with when these cracks in the cosmic eggs take place. So I think the challenge, this is how the Hathers view it, and I've come to share this view, is that I can't be responsible for or concern myself with what others are doing in the opportunity of the crack. What I can do is make the changes in myself, and maybe that will add to this momentum. So the more people become, the more people who make a choice to live their life as positively as they can and be a benevolent influence instead of a destructive influence, the more of us who do this, it it begin, it creates a magnetic attractor and it will create the greater possibility for something to emerge in our future that will be benevolent. And, um, but it comes down to, I think, each of us living our own individual truth of, and living our lives and opening ourselves to the possibilities. And I think that's where the change is going to come from. Individual I'm glad, choices. I'm glad that, that you said that during our interview because it, that's my belief system also. Um, mm-hmm. I don't the think there's going to be a, a, a you know... Superman or Spider-Man or there's no superhero that's going to come in and save us from ourselves. <laughs> we have to find the the dynamo in each of ourselves and in, and collectively to make the changes that we need, that we desire. I know it, for this crack of the egg that we're talking about, on the Internet I get messages from different people and as you say, there's the people that grab on to the negative, mm-hmm. and then there's the people that grab on to the positive. And I think it's very important for the majority to grab a hold of the the, the positive. And keep an eye on the negative. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I think it's important that we, this is just my personal view, uh, you know, we all have our experiences, but... 
I, I, I don't think it works to live life as a Pollyanna and just think that everything is good and everything is wonderful and, and don't pay any attention to what's going on um, in terms of the negativity that's unfolding in the world. But it's some there's an art, and it's an art I have not mastered, I might say, but I've, I'm learning it, which is how to be in the world and be in a positive vibration. But we also be aware that somebody over here is not experiencing that same thing I'm experiencing. They might be in a very negative state. And to somehow be in a, find the place in myself that allows both polarities to exist simultaneously without losing track of my intention, which is to live life positively. If that makes sense. Yes, and it's hard to do. <laughs> yeah, anything worth doing, I find, is at first hard to do. <laughs> oh. Well, I li- I like it where you say, you know, you it's just flipping a switch. Uh, I mean, and that's how I'm going to look at it. You know, it's just like flip the switch. It's no longer yeah. in this right. way and then just flip it and go for it. You know, people really do want to know how to manifest a new reality for themselves. And it is possible. I mean, it totally is. And just flip that switch and go for it. You know what? Head to Tom Kenyon's website, TomKenyon.com. I'm telling you, it's such a wealth of information. Tom, you have nurtured us so wonderfully today. And um, we really thank you for who you are. Oh, my. Um, And thank you for (laughs) creating the space for this information to come through. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Oh, is there anything that we um, have forgot to say that you want to bring forth? No. I think we covered some good bases. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you again. And uh, everybody that's listening up here, jump on to Tom's website, tomkenyon.com, and there's a lot of good free information on there. So have a great day, Tom, because it's beautiful out there. Yes. Thank thank you. You You too. It's been very nice being with you again. It's been nice being with you too. Bye-bye. I loved it too. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Well, I think that was a great interview, don't you, Tess? (laughs) Oh. My heart is just really jumping. You know, it makes such wonderful capabilities and alternatives for people and Get to the website. Check him out. <laughs> ah, okay. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye.